I'll take that. So I need y'all to just amuse me for a moment. Okay. There's a young lady here tonight. Her name's Kayla. She just turned 16. Where are you, Kayla? Kayla, stand up. Stand up, Kayla. Just stand to your feet so that everyone can say, happy birthday, Kayla. I've known her since she was this big, so I want to embarrass her in front of all of y'all. She's single for all the dudes out here. Um, but listen, listen, she is bougie as they get. So if you want her digits, you better have a job, okay? It's the only way it's going to work. Listen, I love, I love camp. I love retreats. I've been a part of them my whole life. I've been able to be at them as a student. I've been able to put them on some of the greatest memories I've ever made, the most important callings in my life, the greatest spiritual decisions I've ever made have been at camps and retreats. One of my lifelong friends is somewhere in here tonight. His name's Chad. He's the executive pastor at Genesis with us. And so Chad and I grew up doing these camps and these retreats. And we were at a middle school retreat one time, and it was, everybody was dressed in camo. And so the whole thing was spiritual warfare, that there's this invisible spiritual battle going all around you that you can't see, but it's happening. The Bible tells us this. And so we're trying to wrap our minds around all of it. And so all of the kids are in a session. And Chad and I are helping lead this camp. And so we're up on this mountain in the Blue Ridge Mountains of Virginia. There's no lights at night, so by the time the sun sets and you get into the mountains, it's pitch black everywhere. And we've been given the task of getting the bonfire ready for everybody after the night session. So we get in his Jeep, he's always owned a Jeep, and we drive up the mountain to the top of the mountain to where this field is, and we go over to the woods and we begin to collect firewood. And so we find a spot and we bring some of the wood and we, we dump it down the field and we get in his Jeep and we go back to the other spot because we're going to need more wood. We're going to build this massive bonfire. And we get in his Jeep and we bring it back and we drop it. And we go back a third time and when we come back, we start driving in his Jeep and we don't see our pile of wood anywhere. So I'm looking at Chad, and I'm like, no, no, I promise you, it's summer around here. Just, just keep driving a little bit further. So he puts the brights on in his Jeep, and, and so we're looking for our firewood, and it's not there. So I'm looking at him. He's looking at me. Like, that's a lot of wood we just dropped down. Where'd he go? And so we drive a little bit further, and as we drive just in the headlights, we begin to see one piece of wood laying down on the ground flat, one piece standing up. One piece laying down, one piece standing up. And I look at him and he looks at me. We're college dudes. We think we're big and bad and tough. But we're on top of a mountain and it's pitch black. I said, dude, what's happened to our wood? I said, I don't know. I said, just, just go a little bit further. At this point, we're getting a little freaked out inside. And so we, we, we get a little bit further and the wood just keeps going. And so we get out of the Jeep. And there's no one around us and it's pitch black. And I start walking up. And all of a sudden I see our wood and it spells something on the side of the mountain. So I look at it. H E L L. Like a fourth grade girl, I scream at the top of my lungs, Chad, it spells hell. So we jump in his Jeep, we go flying off roading all the way down the mountain. All the way back to the group, we come in the back door, they look at us and they go, what's going on? I mean, you look like you've seen a ghost. And we say, we think there are ghosts on the mountain right now. There's something evil happening on this mountain. We were collecting wood and now, it's, now it spells hell on the mountainside. We got to get all the kids back in their cabins. And we got to reset this tomorrow. So we get everybody back in the cabins. No one knows what's going on. Just Chad and I have told everybody there's something evil happening on this mountain. The next morning, we're getting our breakfast as we go through the tray, through the line of the cafeteria. And we're tell, talking about the story and we're talking about what happened. And all of a sudden, I see one of the chefs, the cooks, a young college student dude, start laughing with his back turned towards us. The cooks had played a total prank on us, okay? 
But we had rearranged the whole camp. And the whole reason why was because we were doing this camp about spiritual warfare, good and evil. And for us, we thought, oh my goodness, there are evil demonic spirits on this mountaintop. They've collected our firewood and they're trying to totally take over our whole camp and ruin it. And I remember thinking for a moment, like what if it was true though? What if there were like evil spirits and there was this invisible battle going on all around us? And what would it be like if we had to talk about that? And, and how would you come to understand that as a middle school and a high school student? What if this spiritual stuff was real? A few months back, Brad came to me and he said, listen, we're going to be doing rush camp. And, and so Brian's going to talk about salvation. I was like, that's awesome. This other guy's going to talk about truth. That's great. Pastor Paul's going to talk tomorrow night about the kingdom of God. Like, awesome. What, what am I going to get to speak on? He says, the Holy Spirit. And I thought, oh, why, why do I get this hard topic that's really hard for students to truly grasp? I mean, we know that the Bible talks about it. We sing these songs that talk about the Holy Spirit coming and resting on us. But what does that look like? And so I begin to think quickly, like, how are we going to work through this? And this is what I realized. We can't just dump a bunch of information on you tonight. That's not how this works. My, my favorite meme, my favorite meme video, maybe you've seen it. It's this video of this kid. Can you show that for a second? In school. This is how I feel like I should have been in school sometimes. That's how some of you are before a test, right? Like, just give me the words of this book, and if I can just put them in my head. And that's how we approach God in the Bible. Like, if I can just take these words and I can somehow just place them in my mind, it will all make sense to me. And then we realize there's a lot of these things we're doing that don't make a lot of sense. I mean, just think about what just took place. Like, we know we were worshiping God but how come we don't worship God like that every other day? Why is it just in that moment? And if we're going to talk about these things, if we're going to work through them, how can we make sense of them? And when we talk about the Holy Spirit, let's talk about this one because it's really, really difficult. As a matter of fact, a survey was done just last year that said only 6% of adults believe there's a Holy Spirit at work. Think about that for a second. Only 6% of adults who claim to follow Jesus actually truly believe there's this Holy Spirit of God living inside of them. And if that's the adults, how hard is that for you? How hard is that for you to understand and to grasp and to hold on to? And the more I thought and the more I prayed, the more I studied, what I began to realize is this, is that there's a lot of people that don't believe in the spirit of God, but we sure are curious about a lot of spiritual things. I've got all types of streaming uh, platforms from Netflix and Hulu to Discovery Plus, and I was on Discovery Plus the other day, and at the very top, it has a tab for paranormal series, documentaries, movies. So I clicked it. There were over 30 different series and TV shows on just paranormal activity. I thought, man, that's a lot of shows on one streaming network uh, about some, some spiritual realm that we must be curious about for there to be that many different shows on it. Just last year, movies, TV, streaming network, over, over one billion dollars in sales was made on movies involving anything paranormal and the afterlife. When it, when it comes to, to spirituality, the fastest growing spiritual religion in your generation is Wicca, witchcraft. We, we have a generation that doesn't understand the Holy Spirit of God, but you are very curious about spiritual things. And what if tonight, what if tonight everything about your faith could change? What if tonight was the night 
that everything you claim to be and everything you want to see happen and everything you've been longing for in your life got completely unleashed. So over the next few minutes, I want your undivided attention. All distractions. Someone sleeping next to you. The theme of this whole week is wake up. So just smack them. Wake up. We got something to learn tonight. You'll thank me later. Everybody awake? All right, let's go. Listen to me. All throughout God's story, all throughout God's story, there is a distinction when you find salvation and you encounter Jesus. All throughout the Bible, it shows us and it declares to us that the moment we find salvation, the moment we truly encounter Jesus, everything is supposed to change. And so if we are looking like those around us, talking like those around us, acting like those around us, and by us, I mean the world around us, we have to ask ourselves, where's the distinction? In God's story in the Old Testament, it talks about this spirit of God. God tells Ezekiel in Ezekiel chapter 36, he says, tell the people this, this is what I'm going to do for them when they truly encounter me. I will give you a new heart and a new spirit. I will put in you. Desiree was just talking about Micah saying this morning, I found new life, a new heart, a new spirit. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And God says, tell the people this, I will put my spirit in you. In the New Testament, in Romans, Paul says this to the believers and the Christians there. He says, you, however, listen to me if you follow Jesus are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If, in fact, the spirit of God dwells in you. Anyone who does not have the spirit of Christ does not belong to him. But if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the spirit is life because of righteousness. Now you listen to these two verses and you go, God talks about putting some spirit in me. And Paul says, listen, you're no longer part of flesh. You're part of a spirit. If the spirit of God dwells in me, then I belong to him. And if it doesn't dwell in me, I don't belong to him. Like I'm having a really hard time. This is where I get all confused with the Bible. And I get all confused about my Christianity. And I hear these other people talking and I go, man, I wish I could experience it like that. And so we say, man. It's really hard to think about these things. And I would agree with you. And so months ago, like I said, when Brad told me this, I just, I just began studying. A few weeks back, I got away in an in a Airbnb out in Cocoa Beach just to prepare to share this with you. And I begin to think it's really not that hard for you to understand. You know why? You think this way all the time. This morning you were like, uh, what was it, gas it or trash it? And you're all like, marble. Woo, like yes, yeah, 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 right. And it's all about like all these multiverses and all these different dimensions and all these portals. And I ask you like, dude, I'm so confused. I cannot figure out where these movies are going. You're like, you know, they're in this realm and this portal and this blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, how do you catch all that? Oh, it's easy. If you watch this episode, then you know this. Blah, blah, blah. And we can put all those pieces together. And then when it comes to our faith, the very most important thing in our life, we're like, uh, I don't know. I can't really understand it. Back a few weeks ago, I was watching the original Doctor Strange with my daughter. And I was watching it, I was thinking, oh my goodness, this is perfect. It's perfect for what I want to share tonight. There's this, there's this scene between the Supreme One and Doctor Strange. Doctor Strange is this doctor, this science guy who wants all the answers. It has to be really black and white. It needs to be proven to him for him to see and trust it. And so he looks at the Supreme One and he says, there is no such thing as spirit. And then the Supreme One punches him in the chest because that's what you do when people don't know what they're talking about. And when she punches him in the chest... His spirit comes out of him. I was like, wow. And then she tells him this. She says, you think this material universe is all there is. And then she says this. What mysteries lie beyond your senses? 
in your faith, what mysteries lie beyond the senses you've been using or accustomed to or have been able to be awakened to and aware of. And when I heard her say that, I thought, hmm, that sounds like something I've read in the Bible over and over and over again. Paul says in 1 Corinthians, he says, but as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. These things God has revealed to us through the Spirit. Not taught by human wisdom, but truth by the Spirit. Interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. He says there are spiritual people who get these unknown mysteries revealed to them, these spiritual truths, when they allow the Holy Spirit to work in their life. And there are some of you, you would listen to people this week. Like I was listening to my man Lester up here the other morning. My man is just spitting fire left and right, right? I mean, he's just going. I'm in the back and I'm like, Todd, just leave the stage, bro. Just leave the stage and let him take over. And people are like, man, like he has all this like biblical knowledge. And I'm sitting here going, no, he has allowed the Spirit of God to invade his life. And when the Spirit of God invades your life, you see these spiritual things and you talk in these spiritual ways and people go, I wish I could be like that. <laughs> what? That's... What if Lester's no different than you? And what if he's no different than me? Some of you might say, well, I, I, I would like to be that spiritual person. So could you tell me, Tim, like, how do I sense it? I feel like I'm sensing it when we're worshiping. Like, it's just this feeling I, I've never felt before. Where can I find it? What, what does it look like? What does it sound like? I believe the Bible has answers for all your curious questions. Tito did a great job last night of talking about the fact that you awaken to the truth of God's unchanging truth. So the Bible tells us this. It gives us a picture of what this Holy Spirit is like in our lives. It says in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 29, it says this. It says, our God is a consuming fire. Our God, the one we serve and worship, is a consuming fire. All throughout the Bible, the big story of God, the same image, the same picture of the Spirit of God at work has been the same, and it's been fire. You say, what do you mean? Moses encounters God where? At a burning bush. The nation of Israel is led out of Egypt, and God says, listen, you're going to follow my lead. I'm going to be a cloud by day, and I'm going to be fire by night. And oh, by the way, I want you to set up this tabernacle, and eventually you're going to build this temple, and inside of those places is going to be another place called the Holy of Holies. That's where I'm going to show up. And when I show up, there's going to be two statues, two angels, two cherubim, and there's going to be a fire in between them, and that's going to be my presence. In the book of Daniel, you learn about the story Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And they're taking a bold stand for God. And so they get thrown into a what? A fiery furnace. And when they come back to see if they've been consumed by the fire, they have a question. They say, wait a second, I thought you threw three people in there. He says, yeah, there's three. They said, there's not three, there's four. In Acts chapter 2, the disciples of Jesus are all in a room praying. They're all on their faces before God. And it says the Holy Spirit shows up. And when he shows up, it's like little flames falling on them. Fire is a symbol for God's presence. Why? It purifies. It engulfs. It enrages. It consumes. And the Holy Spirit of God 
is to invade our life like a flame that consumes us and engulfs us and enrages in us and it purifies us and it does something in us that nothing else on this earth can do. And so the Bible speaks all throughout it of the Spirit of God at work. And it tells us he has distinct roles. He said, when we're talking about the Holy Spirit of God, why do I need to even care? What is it about him that needs to be important for me? Well, I want to give you three roles of the Spirit tonight. The first one is this, he comforts. Think about this for a moment. Jesus has gathered with his disciples they're with Jesus himself. That'd be pretty nice, right? Like you're here this week learning about him. You're here declaring that you believe in him. You're worshiping him. But to really be with him. And then he looks at them and he says, hey, let me tell all of you something. It's better for me to go away. Because if I go away, I get to send the Holy Spirit, the comforter. Now your generation. Your generation, more than any other on the planet to ever exist, has more mental health issues, more anxiety, more panic, more stress, more fear among students than ever, ever before. And there are a bunch of you, you're just looking for some answers. I don't want this overwhelming feeling where I feel like I can't breathe and, and I, I can't get air in my lungs inside of me. I don't want to go on thinking about these things in my head that I can't get out any longer. And God's saying, listen, there is a distinct role my spirit brings you. It's comfort and it's peace, and many of you keep searching for it in all the wrong places. You try to find it in substances. You try to find it in relationships. You try to find it in harming yourself. You're doing all these things, and I want you to encounter and experience my very spirit. He comforts us. The other thing he does is he calls us. He brings clarity to us. There are a bunch of you going, I don't know what I want to do with my life. I don't know what God wants to do with my life. I, I'm waiting to hear from him. I hear all these other people talk. Uh, Pastor Paul and I, we, we grew up in Brian's youth group. We sat literally where you've sat. And we listened to him preach to us as I was watching him preach to you the other night. And then my mind was blown. I was like, because here's Paul and I, we'll be preaching to you tonight as well. You know why? Because at a retreat or a camp somewhere, I can guarantee you both of us can declare we heard the Holy Spirit of God call us. And some of you are going, I just want to hear that. I'm, I'm trying and I'm praying and I'm searching. And I, and I just, I just want to hear it that way. Let me tell you something. He speaks in bonfires and he speaks in small fires. He speaks in whirlwinds and he speaks in whispers. Some of you, he will sound an alarm. Others of you, it will be a still, small voice. He speaks how he wants to speak, but he clearly speaks and he clearly calls. When I went to Brian in 2007 and I said, Brian... I think God is calling me to start a church. I was sitting in his office at Westridge Church. He said, how do you know? I said, Brian, this is, these are the words I use. I said, there's this fire inside of me. And I keep saying no to it. And the more I say no to it, the more miserable I am. Because it keeps burning and burning and burning. And I have to say yes to it. It comforts you. It clarifies, and, it, and in clarity, it calls you. And then it also does this, it convicts you. This is the part that we don't want to know about the Holy Spirit. This is the part right now that's going to change your faith forever here tonight. Convicts us. This is how he does it. 
He does it through a word called discernment. Because you can't get it in any other place. There's a lot of you, you know good things to do and you know bad things to do. You know what discernment is? Discernment is the difference between right and almost right. Let me give you an example. Are you ready? Some of you girls are dating good guys. But they're not godly guys. Nope. Because some of you guys are trying to be good guys and you need to man up and be godly guys. Okay? Some of you would tell your parents, my friends are good friends. But they're not godly influences. Yeah, but this, 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 this TV series or this album, it's good. Everyone else is listening to it, but it's not godly. You see how quickly we kind of push back when we begin to realize, I want the power of the Holy Spirit inside of me, but wait, I don't want him to do everything he's supposed to do in me. And when he begins to convict us, we have to begin to ask the tough questions. And there are some of you going, listen, I want the Spirit in me. I want the Holy Spirit of God in me. Let me give you good news if you follow Jesus. He's already in you. He said, I give you a new heart and I put my Spirit in you. He's already there. Some of you just haven't waken up to it yet. You've been asleep spiritually. And you've been playing games with your faith. And when it comes to your spiritual life and awakening yourself to the Holy Spirit, this is what you must understand. Here's a key understanding about all of this. Are you ready? The Holy Spirit works best in holy places. You really want to find the Holy Spirit then you have to desire it and open up every room of your life for him to work. Let me show you how, if you're taking notes. What if you begin to realize your social media is a holy sight unto the Lord? Every account you follow, every person you interact with, Everything you scroll and see on whatever social media account you have, TikTok, Snapchat, Instagram, Facebook, whatever it is, what if you begin to realize it is a holy sight unto the Lord? What if you begin to realize and awaken to this truth that every streaming platform you spend time binge watching, it's a holy venue unto the Lord? Like, like, what if Jesus showed up and said, hey, show me your history of all the things you've been watching. What if you begin to realize that the playlist you constantly listen to is a holy sanctuary unto the Lord? Yeah, but you know, everybody listens to it, Tim. I don't want you to be everybody. I want you to be the person that God put the Holy Spirit inside of. With a new heart and a new spirit to change your life and change those around you. And what about this one? What if you realize, students, that your body is a holy temple unto the Lord? Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you? Whose you have from God. Listen to this. You, you're not your own. You were bought with a price. So glorify God in your bodies. What is he saying? He's saying, I gave you a new spirit, and I placed it inside of you. 
and your body became a holy temple to God. Everything you do, everything you take in, everything you consume, everything you act upon, your body is a holy temple in which my spirit has been put inside of. And everywhere you go and everything you do, you must realize as a follower of Jesus, you are no longer your own. You belong to Jesus. You cannot belong to yourself and to him. You surrender to him. He gets to have you so that he can use you for the purpose he created you for. And you live in a culture that is screaming every time you turn around. It is your identity. You choose it. It is your body. You're right. It is God's identity. It is God's body because it's a holy temple because the Holy Spirit of God now dwells in you. He doesn't look at you and say, you know what, I know. I sent my son to die for you. I mean, I bought you with a heavy price. I literally sacrificed my son. You just choose what you want, do what you want, have fun with what you want, go explore, claim, confirm, accept, whatever you want. It's okay. I just gave up my son for you. I sacrificed my son for you. And I took my spirit and placed him in you. And you want to declare that whatever you do with this is yours. Because that's what the world is telling you. And that's why you don't understand the power of the Holy Spirit that can be at work inside of you. Paul said you are no longer flesh, but in the spirit. Therefore, your worth your value, your identity, your strength all come from his spirit. And if the Holy Spirit works best in holy places, then the flip side of that is just as true. That the Holy Spirit of God is unable to work in unholy spaces. When Moses was approaching God in a fiery bush, God told Moses, don't take another step. Take off your sandals because you're about to step into holy ground. When the priest was to go into the tabernacle and the temple, into this holy of holy space where God was, if they were not pure, purified before God, they had to walk in with a rope tied around their waist because if they were not pure, God would strike them dead and they'd have to pull out their dead corpse. God says, I'm not playing games. I cannot work in unholy spaces. When we look at the disciples in Acts chapter 2, they are on their faces before God in prayer, waiting and calling out and waiting and crying out for this very spirit of God to show up. They're creating a holy place because he's unable to work in unholy spaces. Listen to me tonight. For some of you, your greatest failure as a Christian will not be that you fall short of holiness. Your greatest failure as a Christian is that you will extinguish the Holy Spirit inside of you. You say, what do you mean? Paul says in 1 Thessalonians, do not quench the Spirit. What does that mean? That means when the Holy Spirit comes and he begins to convict you, and you begin to realize, I probably shouldn't go down this road. You ignore it and you go anyways. And when the Holy Spirit begins to whisper in your ear, hey, you don't have to do that. You begin to make excuses and blame other people. Well, they did it. They're doing it. Why can't I? And you do it anyways. When the Holy Spirit begins to say, hey, listen, that's not a holy space for me to work, and you say, 
everyone else is telling me, I can still do this and claim Jesus. You begin to quench the spirit. And you do it enough. And you ignore it enough. And you reject it enough. And you do your own thing as more often as you want. All of a sudden it says, it goes silent. You can't hear him anymore. You can't feel him anymore. You can't find him anymore. He says, I kept trying and you kept telling me no. I kept trying to call you and you kept ignoring me. I kept trying to tell you don't do that and you went for it anyways. And your greatest failure will not be that you fall short of holiness. It will be that you quench the Holy Spirit inside of you. And you will forever be walking around going, I wish, I wish I could hear him. I, I wish I could sense him. I wish I could be empowered by him. And it all hinges on the simple truth and the question of, have you quenched the Spirit? And that, that, that dialogue between Dr. Strange and the Supreme One. When they get done talking about the spirit and she shows him that he has a spirit life inside of him. She then tells him this. She says, now that you've been made aware that there's something more. Now that you've been made aware, now that you've been awakened to the truth that there's something more. You can go back to your old life or you can serve something greater. You can go back to your old life or you can serve something greater. As Brad said, in 2004, we sat in an office space with a whiteboard. Hey, let's do a summer camp for kids. I think it would be awesome. Let's just do our own. What are you going to call it? So we started putting all these names all over the whiteboard. Oh, that'd be awesome. I think they like that. What about this? And all of a sudden, someone just put on the board, I don't remember who in the room, they just put the word rush. And they begin to explain, they said, you know what? Students love just a rush of excitement. Like, we'll, we'll, we'll go ride that roller coaster over and over and over again. Because, man, I just get this great rush when I'm ever on the ride. And when, when you get a rush and you encounter something so thrilling, you want to experience it time and time and time again. What if that is the space we created every single year for students, that for one week, we could create a holy place so the Holy Spirit of God could work. And there are those of you that come and you say, man, I never feel closer to God than I do at Rush Camp. I've never heard God so more clearly than I do at Rush Camp. I never worship so freely that I have at rush camp. And I wanted to keep going. And here's where you mess up. If you think it was because of camp. Or if you realize it's because the Holy Spirit of God was burning inside of you all week. And the same Spirit of God burning inside of you all week long here goes back with you home. And he continues to burn if you let him. He'll continue to engulf you, to consume you, to overcome you, to empower you. But the choice is yours. Because when you get back home and he begins to work and you go, eh, it was easier at camp. It's not so easy now. Eh. 
I didn't mind saying no when I was around all my Christian friends. But now that I'm with my non-Christian friends, it's not so easy. And for some of you this week, you showed up looking for God to do something in your life. And the Holy Spirit of God said, I brought you here because I wanna comfort you. You've just been searching in the wrong place. All that mental anguish you're carrying, I wanna comfort that. Some of you, he's calling you. I don't say this haughty, I'm just saying there's a Tim and there's a Paul sitting in these seats right now. That God is calling, the Holy Spirit of God is saying, you're next. You're the one that years from now is gonna be preaching in, a bunch of, in front of other students. Just like they were students, so I'm using the now, I wanna use you and you're hearing me, don't say no to me, you'll be miserable doing anything else the rest of your life. And then there's a third group. And this is the group I wanna talk to right now. The Holy Spirit of God brought you here this week. You, you didn't realize that. You just thought you showed up. Came because a friend came. Came because that cute girl's here, that cute guy's here. My, my, my good friend Dave Cole used to say, a poor motive is better than no motive at all. You're here. That's all that matters. But here's why he brought you here. Listen to me. From the very front to the very back, he brought you here this week to convict you of an unholy space in your life that you are not supposed to leave Daytona with and go back home with. He said, I drew you to a holy place so that you can drop your unholy things in Daytona and don't come back home with them anymore. Because I want to burn inside of you and I can't when you keep going back to that unholy thing in your life. And so here's what we're going to do. If that's you here tonight, it may be a relationship you're in. There may be a relationship you're in right now that's unholy and you're doing unholy things in that relationship. And that relationship's supposed to end tonight. But Pastor Tim, then I won't have anybody. You will have the very Holy Spirit of God burning inside of you, which will be far greater than what you are dealing with and going through and causing for yourself right now. And I'm not playing games with that. And there's some of you right now, the Holy Spirit is convicting you, he's telling you, that's you. And you're going, uh-uh, uh-uh, nope, not me, yeah, it's you. And there are some of you that your phone has become an unholy space for God. You hide in the shadows and the darkness to watch and see things you shouldn't be watching, looking at, viewing, seeing at all. And the Holy Spirit of God's saying, that doesn't come back home from Daytona with you. Some of you are taking substances, you're doing things to yourself, you're involved in just ungodly practices and he's saying, nope, I want it. I want it, I want it tonight so that I can burn. I can burn and consume you and let you encounter me like that never before. And so here's what we're gonna do. The band's gonna come up and we're gonna make every single aisle and space down here just an altar. And when we get done praying, if you need to come forward and say, listen, there is sin in my life, something unholy that I'm giving to God tonight so that I can awaken to the power of the Holy Spirit inside of me. I want you just to come kneel and give it to God. Just give it. I don't want this anymore. I'm not gonna do this anymore. 
don't want to practice this anymore. I don't want to watch this anymore. I don't want to listen to this anymore. I don't want to be in this relationship anymore. I want the very best God has for me. But as I said up front, there's a distinction. A distinction between those who truly follow Jesus and those who are just claiming religion. It may be a leader. It may be a college student. You're here this week. I don't know. But I'm going to pray. And then I just want you to come. Just come pray. I want you to do business with God, and I want you to leave in Daytona unholy spaces so the Holy Spirit can work in holy places like you. Father, tonight, your word declares, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. That when we truly find you, you give us a new heart and a new spirit. We are no longer of the flesh, but we are spiritual people that you want to reveal spiritual things to, spiritual truths, spiritual realities that no one else gets to experience except those who know you by name, who have your spirit alive inside of them. Tonight we believe with all of our heart that the Holy Spirit of God works best in holy places. But we're willing to admit that there's a lot of us that have been living in unholy spaces. And so tonight, we leave those in Daytona so that you can do a great and mighty work in us. Holy Spirit of God, be a rushing wind right now, be a still small voice, be a blazing fire, be a small flame. Change people the only way you know how, the only way you can. It is in your power, by your might, by your strength, we declare all these things. In Jesus' name. Ready to come? Come.